Um, so this session, this session is the se second of six presentations that we plan to uh, provide before the end of April next year. Um, this session is hosted by the Manitoba FASD Coalition and the Manitoba FASD Family Network. Before we proceed, I just want to share that we acknowledge that the Manitoba FASD Coalition gathers and works on the treaty land of Manitoba traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Assiniboine, Dakota, and Dene's people, along with the homeland of the Métis Nation. We are fortunate today to have Bridget Kosmak and Shelly Hatch speaking about embracing neurodiversity, supporting students in the classroom setting. Bridget Kosmak is a neurodiversity support teacher for students with FASD at Inclusion Support Services in the Winnipeg School Division. She has been in the role for the last three years where she provides support to students with FASD, assists adults supporting the child by providing strategies and collaborates with school teams in developing appropriate education programming. She has over 20 years of classroom support teaching experience. Bridget is a former teacher at the Bridges FASD classroom at David Livingston Community School. We also have Shelly Hatch. She is the neurodiversity support teacher for students with an autism spectrum disorder at Inclusion Support Services in the Winnipeg School Division. She's been in this position for nine years. Her prior experiences with MATC's Neurodevelopmental Services for Children with ASD, a resource teacher and classroom teacher. Shelly's role is to help adults supporting a child with autism understand how the autism is affecting the child and then assist the child's school team on how to provide the supports needed. So this presentation is being recorded and will likely be posted next week, early in the week for a one week period. Um, and the slides and additional resources along with an evaluation will be sent out early next week um, to all the participants. We're also asking that if you have any questions that they be, that you post them in the chat and Laura will be following the chat and um, posing the questions to the speakers at the end of the session. Um, I think that's it. We're ready for Shelly and Bridget. Take it away guys. Thank you, Andrea. Um, as Andrea has mentioned uh, about Shelly and I, our positions prior to two years ago was ASD support teacher and I was FASD support teacher. And because of the paradigm shift that's happening uh, with the language neurodiversity, uh, our division with consultation to community groups changed our job titles to neurodiversity support teacher. So you may hear us refer to autism spectrum disorder, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and ADHD in, in and around this presentation. So we'll, we'll just start with, uh, humanity is diverse. There are many ways to observe and express diversity. Neurodiversity refers to brain differences. No human being falls outside of the spectrum of human diversity. As the asterisk on the umbrella points out, this is not an exhaustive list. It is ever changing. The neurodiversity movement came out of the need for people to be valued rather than feeling devalued about their differences. This is why people with any of the above diagnoses want to be involved in this movement. Further, it encourages us to reject the culturally entrenched negativity and stigma, which has typically surrounded those that live, learn, and experience the world differently due to brain wiring. The term encourages us to view neurological differences such as FASD, autism, ADHD, et cetera, as you can see on the slide, as natural and normal variations of the human brain. We are all different, not deficient. When we see in a child's Kim file or hear that a child has ADHD, FASD, or autism, it is a natural response to feel anxious or concerned about what this may mean in our environment. You may ask, what will I see in the classroom? What extra work may, 
may need to be done to support students. When we see or hear the diagnosis, we think, what do I have to do differently? Now, what if we read or heard the child is creative, a good artist, works really well when lessons include hands-on hands -on aspects, can use programs on the computer or demonstrate what they know, or they really like science? May your reaction be different. Students receive a medical diagnosis and then we make presumptions or assumptions about the student, which may be completely false. Each student is an individual with strengths and stretches. This is part of being on the human spectrum. Take the time to think about our classrooms, the routines, strategies, tools, adaptations you are using. Do your students have access to flexible seating? Are you giving students additional time for tasks, providing them with graphic organizers or technology? There are hands-on activities, there are videos to watch, there are recordings to review after a class or part of your lessons. We have listed only a few great self-regulation strategies and adaptations, as you can see on the screen. And we want you to think about like what you are doing well right now, right? Like we have really changed our attitude towards learning and what is needed in a regular classroom. Classrooms are looking very different and they're sounding very different. So we want to acknowledge that you are already probably doing some things to meet the need of students. And we really have come a long way. So there's new information about the brain and how it learns. Imaging such as MRIs or PET scans allows a picture into the brain. The brain with FASD could have fewer or interrupted connections. Some of our students may have little or no connections and have a lack of communication between hemispheres. We have additional information about our sensory system, which influences how we take information both from the outside world and the inside of our bodies. We have a better understanding about our body's stress response system as well, and the influence of past experiences on the system. You know, we're really learning more about how that whole interoceptive sense, um, along with proprial session and vestibular, is really um, impacting um, a lot of our students as well as yeah. many, like, not just the ones who are neurodiverse. So we need to see them through a brain-based lens. Since neurodivergent individuals have different and varied brain wiring, we need to use brain-based lens, a brain-based lens when we are looking and working to support students. But there's a word of caution here. As we speak to some differences of students who fit under neurodiverse umbrella, there's a great variability. This group is very heterogeneous. It is not one size fits all, and strategies will vary between students. As we say sometimes, one student, one child with FASD, ADHD, or ASD is just one child with FASD, ADHD, or ASD. Strategies often get abandoned because they're tried only once and it didn't work. These strategies need to be tried over a considerable amount of time and adjusted for each individual student. We need to acknowledge that each individual will exhibit their own range of strengths and stretches and those areas in need of support. And I think that's why sometimes people, you know, I know I've been out to schools and I think, oh, they've been so many kids with autism in school. Why do they need to call me back? But that's because the autism affects everyone differently. And so sometimes you just need to learn a little bit more or to think about how it affects that particular child. So we're going to talk about some of the challenges um, in the school environment for the neurodiverse brain. But we're going to start with sensory processing, because it's something that we all experience. And I don't think we really appreciate the human body and the nervous system. Um, it's usually all of this sensory processing may be happening below our sur the surface of awareness. And especially until we hear you know, that loud bell or we have that strong scent well, usually it's the scent of popcorn. I'm like, oh, where's the popcorn? Where's the popcorn? Like, I want to go get some to eat. So our sensory, our nervous system takes in information from, as we just said, outside the environment. For example, the temperature in the room, sounds in the hallway, 
as well as from inside our bodies, that's an interoceptive sense, recognizing when I'm hungry, recognizing when I need to go to the washroom, or am I feeling anxious or afraid? And this, the nervous system affects and highly influences our ability to feel safe in an environment. Neurodiverse students also often have processing, uh, sensory processing challenges, which impact their ability to make sense of the input they are receiving throughout the day and in the different environments they encounter. I keep thinking of the gymnasium and all the input of the bouncing balls when it's basketball season or and the loudspeaker with the music blaring. The overwhelming feeling of being bombarded by sensory information may affect a student's sense of calm. As a result, the student may appear disorganized, confused, emotionally upset, scared, may shut down or act out or leave the environment uh, completely. But in reality, their nervous systems are having difficulty making sense of the world around them. So we have students um, in high school or you know, middle years who may arrive late and not get to class on time because they need a different transition time. The hallways are too noisy and then there's always that um, potential of being bumped and misinterpreting that um, sensory input in the hallway. And we have students who need movement to focus. Um, the tools and strategies um, they need, we try to keep them, you know, like appropriate for what grade level they're at. But um, I know yesterday I was with a student and I was getting too close to them. And so he, you know, not so gently, but used his hand to let me know that uh, you need to move back. You're getting too close to me. So we hope, we hope when we get enough sleep, we hope uh, we're feeling good, we don't have the sniffles. Um, and sometimes I think it's just when the whole stars are aligning, we have an effective sensory processing system. Um, it allows us to do all those things um, listed on the screen. Um, but we, need to be able to process that information efficiently and effectively so we can meet the demands of the day. But for our neurodiverse students, it take, takes a huge amount of energy to meet those sensory demands. And so oftentimes, um, because of their total like energy expansion, expansion during the day, um, they go home and they need to have a safe place and it, might be one of those reasons why homework's not getting done in the evenings. And we all know if we've had a particularly demanding day, we need to go home and help and restore our energy so we can come back tomorrow. But some days the input um, is not being processed effectively or efficiently in an organized manner. And this leads to sensory overload. And sometimes we see behaviors so they may have challenges filtering the information. Information can be too much. It, be, it can be too little to register and it might be too hard to recognize. And then when the sensory system gets overloaded, it can trigger a fight, flight or freeze response. And this response is involuntary and automatic due to our brain's um, stress response system. And then what may happen is that adults misinterpret the actions. They might see the child as being hyperactive, defiant, resistant, avoidant, or aggressive, when in reality, their nervous systems have difficulty making sense of the world around them. We have students who have horrible sleep hygiene. They are always tired. Falling asleep is difficult. Um, staying asleep is difficult, and then you're the alarm goes off and you're hitting the snooze button or maybe you're not even setting an alarm. And the research is showing us that we have a society that is chronically sleep deprived. Or we see hoodies up going up in class and you know that might be um, to get the, there's too much light. It might be that there's too many auditory inputs. And so I'm just trying to protect um, myself. 
Mexico. This is a graphic from the Merit Center, the work of Dr. Stuart Shanker. Um, so really what it's doing is taking a look at our classrooms and have we looked at all the biological or sensory stressors in our classrooms? Um, we have the pleasure of going into classrooms and some of them have so many things on the wall or so many um, on the whiteboard in front. The whiteboard is filled with information and then how does a student determine what is important and what is not? And how, if I'm visually oriented or if I'm looking for any reason for a distraction, I'm not looking at those. Um, oftentimes, are you taking um, use of, we have classrooms with huge windows, if you're fortunate. Um, and then I see a lot of teachers um, adapting in their classrooms with what I would call spotlighting. So there's, or I guess it'd be like, a, there'd be a little desk with a lamp so that they could turn off some of the lights and yet have lighting where the student can read and get the task done. Um, and then smells, we all know that um, during this COVID time and the use of hand sanitizers, <laughs> we can often, um, some of those finding one that actually had a good smell um, was important. And um, so just think of this, of the shampoos and the hand creams that you're using that could be um, troubling for a student. And then there's the seating options. Um, it takes a lot of energy to sit in a chair. I know we see lots of opportunity for kids to have move and sit cushions, Zoom and chairs, um, but are kids able to move too? As some of our meetings as adults, I know that you get people who are getting up and standing at the back and just rocking back and forth and help them pay attention. So do you allow the, that opportunity in your classrooms? I'm just thinking even right now, how many times have I moved? How many times have you moved across and uncrossed your legs just to help you stay focused? In her new book um, entitled Thrive, Michelle Borba um, did some research um, with high school and university students around the area of regulation and mindfulness. And the response back from uh, the participants was that we do not teach regulation skills enough or give students enough time to practice these skills and find strategies that work for them. And typically we might think of learning regulation skills um, as an elementary issue, but learning to self-regulate and what you need in that moment and over time to restore your energy continues throughout our lifetime. So we need to continue to teach students regulation strategies and provide them with tools throughout their school career. And then, of course, in adolescence, that ability to self-regulate gifts due to that burst of brain development and all those hormones occurring. So teaching, modeling, and providing practice and class is necessary. So we all often talk about challenging ourselves just a little bit because we tend to go to those strategies that work for us. But there are many strategies out there that you could explore with your students and then do a little survey afterwards. Um, Prior to a test, um, give your students an opportunity to do some breathing or tapping so that it would help them get calm and focused um, for that test. Okay, so now we will move on to communication challenges. Communication is very complex and includes many aspects. Basically, it's all the way we are sharing our thoughts and our ideas and our feelings. It includes speech, like articulation, voice, and fluency, as well as language, like understanding, expressing, reading, and writing. Receptive language is the language we understand. It includes the receiving of in, 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 uh, <laughs> oh, it's a lot. It includes receiving information accurately, interpreting and remembering it correctly, and then acting on that information. Some examples include like following directions, understanding conversations, answering questions accurately, maybe even appropriately. Uh, we often see students nod their head or give clue, cues that they understand. And, and this may be something they can repeat back to, but they may not be understanding the information. Weak receptive language skills can be masked by those phrases we hear in the classroom. I don't know, I forget, or yeah, mm-hmm. And when we and when trying to describe something, they have troubles 
being specific and might really say, oh, that round thing, when they're talking about like a roll of tape or a ball. Here's some ways we can support. When there's too much verbal information presented to a student, they can be overwhelmed and appear really quite inattentive. Repeating, although it is valuable, in some, some circumstances, we're really then adding more processing of the verbal information for them. So pro provide some visuals along with your directions. Often we also do this as teachers, we're trying to get kids' attention. And we're, and we're just starting the instructions and we hope that they'll just stop talking and listen to us. Um, so waiting, asking, telling them that they are getting important information, waiting for them all to be quiet. This really hit home for me, um, I think at home with my husband and you know, I'm in the kitchen and he's in the family room watching TV and of course a hockey game is on. So it's a highly preferred, something he really likes. Um, and you know, you're talking away and then realize he hasn't heard a word you said. So we do this with kids all the time. We don't give them a cue. So now we call his name, we wait for him to look, and then we cross our fingers that he actually still is going to process that verbal information. <laughs> Expressive communication is a message to another person. It enables us to be able to express our wants and our needs thoughts and ideas, argue our point of views, develop our use of language and writing, and engage in successful interactions with others. As soon as you add expressive language, it automatically increases the demands of the task for the student. It can look like difficulty finding the right word for memory, like we suggested before, or calling toast uh, warm bread. Some students have what we call cocktail party conversations. Speech that's fluent but lacks content. We use pragmatic language or social um, when we are turn taking, initiating and maintaining and ending a conversation, staying on topic, ask, asking and answering questions, and making comments. We are really impressed when a student has this huge vocabulary, but if we listen closely, we can hear how there's a lack of organization and really it's just what some, uh, some people call information dumping. Just because they can say it doesn't mean they really understand it. So be cautious. Here's some ways to support. Giving students wait time allows them the opportunity to find the right words and form their ideas. So we're gonna set a timer. We're not gonna tell you for how long. And just think about this. You got it ready? Okay, that was five minutes, five seconds. So just think about in your classroom. The average wait time in a classroom for a teacher is three to five seconds. This really doesn't give a student the amount of time they need to process what you're asking them or to come up with an answer for you or to even like develop a thought. And I've seen this happen time and time again in classrooms and one particular instance where the adult, a child was asked a question for the, like they wanted their opinion on which story to do for readers theater. And um, the adult said, oh, I guess you don't have an opinion. And they just like, just wait, just wait. He does. And uh, it seemed like a really considerable amount of time that we had to give the student. Yeah, sometimes we need to give them 30 seconds. Sometimes I ask my students, are you thinking? And they're like, yeah, so I'm okay, I will wait however long I need to. Just giving them that time and that permission to do that. So we want to point out that we tend to use more questions and commands with students who have communication challenges. Questions can be abstract and difficult to answer. Sometimes students feel that they must answer correctly. Some kids give an answer because they know one is expected, but they may not have the thought they answer through. Like sometimes kids just answer no, and they haven't really listened to the question you're asking them. They'd be asking them, would you like some pizza? No. So be mindful of that. Um, when we're using those commands, we're really robbing the student of opportunities to see the big picture and to be independent. 
Commands can also trigger fight, flight, or freeze responses. And furthermore, a student doesn't follow through on our command within a few seconds, we're seeing this as a non-compliance. So we need to increase our statements as a communication approach referred to as declarative language, as you can see the little uh, cheat sheet there on the screen. Um, instead of saying get in line, you can say it's time for lunch and you just point to the door. It gives them an the opportunity to think about what you've asked them or the command you've given them. So we also see um, adolescents who have language difficulties and there's problems in this area for students, particularly in the high school setting, because language plays a major role. There's an exceptional, ex there's a huge expectation of our students in high school because there's that increased vocabulary, so, you know, the sentence structures, the ability to use different kinds of language in different situations with their friends, with their teachers. And us as teachers, we need to realize the receptive language abilities continue to be impacted through the middle and high school years. This isn't just an elementary school problem. Language challenges can also lead to feelings of failure and low self-esteem for academics and social success. So the good news though, is that language and cognition uh, in the brain imaging that we have seen, it exists in two separate parts. So we should not assume that students who struggle with language are not intelligent. And auditory processing challenges also occur in three to 5% of school age students. This is an approximate percentage. Um, this includes students with FSD, autism, ADHD, and other developmental disorders. And really it's where your ears and your brain don't fully work together. And they may have a hard time hearing the small sound differences. And it's kind of like how we were feeling in the first few months of COVID. We're all wearing our masks and we're like, what did you say? What did you say? Or you mishear them? So here's some ways to support auditory processing challenges, many of which you probably are already doing in your home or in your classroom. And um, you can see the list here. We've talked to many of these already through this presentation. So we're going to move on to some um, other learning challenges that um, neurodiverse students may experience in varying degrees. And these are executive functioning skills. And executive functioning skills are the cognitive processes that our brain uses to help us carry out our daily tasks. And we use them all the time. We are born with the capacity to learn these skills, but we are not born with the skills themselves. So this means we need modeling, instruction, and practice to develop them. And I know it can be very tiring for adults. I know we're doing lots of reading for adults, parents of, of kids who have um, ADHD. And it's like, it's an exhausting because we are continually helping them initiate something to um, manage their time well, to get all their materials together. Um, each of us has our own ex executive functioning strengths and challenges. So you might be strong in one area and not in another. And students who are neurodiverse can have average intelligence. So again, it's not a sign of, of um, lack of intelligence. It's a sign of struggling with executive functioning skills. So executive functioning challenges have been identified as an area of need to support and all of our students who are neurodiverse, FASD, ADHD, or ASD, and others. Um, and I'm thinking also just with every regular adult or person that you are interacting with. I know I have my own that I'm good at and some that I'm not so good at. So we're gonna take a look at only three of the processes because they're, they affect um, students in our schools. The first one is working memory. On there, sorry. The first one is working memory. Um, this skill allows us to work with information without losing track of what we're doing. Um, it's what's happening when we're um, using that six digit identification, uh, uh, identification factor in our, in our emails now. It's like, okay, I've got to remember these six numbers, just these six, right? And each of us has our own capacity 
for working memory. And working memory is affected by things like stress and hunger and being tired. We know that we can't um, access it as much. So there are ways to support. We can give graphic organizers in advance. We can make participation in our lessons active. We can um, let them hear it, let them see it, let them move it. Um, we also can play games. Uh, many teachers are using games such as Jeopardy and Kahoot to help kids get engaged and um, assist their working memory. I remember the balls we had with the addition facts on them and you throw them around the room. And all of those are a great way to get up and get kids moving. So this graphic is one, it's kind of it's from an old book that I have. Um, but it speaks to the many attentional issues that students can have. Um, the student is to be looking and listening at the teacher and thinking about what the teacher is saying. And yet, if it's close to lunchtime, um, they're thinking of their stomach is grumbling, or they're also paying attention, uh, thinking about what they're going to do after school, or the great football game they watched last night. And oh my goodness, it's like almost time to leave, right? So we also want to mention, and this is probably an example of this, is kids who aren't paying attention aren't always the ones that are moving. We have kids whose bodies are still, but their brain's not engaged at all. And students who might be sitting there very calmly, listening to the bird outside in the trees, or finding that one spot on the wall and doing something exciting with it. So lots of ways to help students with attentional issues. Remember, this is about them finding what works for them. And when you see a class that's already kind of losing, and kind of moving and starting to uh, lose their focus, give them a brain break, do a movement break. We see lots of um, teachers incorporating that into their day. Another factor for students who are neurodiverse can be processing speed. Processing speed is the pace at which you take in information, make sense of it, and start to respond. It can, um, this can be verbal or visual information. So visual, verbal, or motor processing speed affects language, communication, reading, writing, math, and social interactions. Some people just take longer to process some information more than others. And lastly, we want to point out that slow processing speed isn't related to intelligence. And actually, I saw an incident up in the classroom just yesterday where an adult gave a direction to a student and they were concerned because it hadn't happened. They didn't follow through right away. So just give them time. And finally, his motor abilities were such that he was able to lower himself to the floor to sit at the carpet. Now, if there's if you have students that are challenged in this area, there are strategies to support. And the graphic, of course, is not an exhaustive list. Um, I know one of the FASD gurus, Diane Malvin, refers to um, kids as 10-second kids in a one second world. And I know the comment I often make about kids with autism is the world comes too fast and too much. So we do need to pause and give students time to process information. And I do want to point out from the graphic, the whole um, self-advocacy um, bullet there. Um, often we have students who are afraid or don't know how to ask for help or ask questions for clarification. So we do need to create a climate where asking questions is expected. So the pictures you're seeing on the screen are from the ASD Nest program in uh, New York, where children who are neurodivergent are in the classrooms with kids who aren't. And just those practicing and establishing uh, entry and exiting routines, taking the time to let kids and teach kids and model for them how they put away their work and keep it in an organized fashion so it doesn't get lost. 
So think of the routines and structures you have in your classrooms. And executive functioning skills are skills we need to teach. And we need to help kids find strategies that work for them. Having these strategies helps them build confidence. So now we will take a look at um, brain-based learning. But we want to highlight the amount of the brain connections and processes used when we ask students to complete core curriculum outcomes. We're talking about writing, reading, and math. We need to really appreciate the complexity of the writing process. Writing is the largest neural developmental orchestra a person can conduct. Look at all the processes on the screen that have to happen to have a written output. It involves language, organization, motor planning and control, sensory regulation, and integration of all of these functions all at one time. If you think about it, our brain does a lot of work just to produce a written thought. Imagine a student who needs to complete a writing task but struggles with working memory, sense formation and organizational skills. That time that it'll take them to do that is much greater than a neurotypical child. And they'll vary from child to child. Probably anxiety producing. Oh, for me, 100%. Reading is not a natural ability, like the acquisition of spoken language. There's no areas of the brain that specialize in reading. It's like writing. It's one of the most difficult tasks we have to ask the young brains to undertake. And we ask them to learn the rules, specific rules. And then we tell them there's exceptions to the rules, like the letter Y. Sometimes it's, it, it says I, and sometimes it says E. And you know they have to hang on and learn that and understand it. Or words with multiple meanings, like bark, like tree bark, dog barking, or bank. A river bank or a place you keep your money. Yeah. Reading like writing involves connections between different regions of the brain. So again, the processes are greater. So we need to just be patient and mindful of that. Consider all the brain processes involved with all the details in a math equation or problem solving situation. Attentional issues may cause you to miss important details. Language is needed to explain how you solve the problem. And we often ask our students, how do you know? Show me how you know. Show me how you got the answer. And we're constantly asking them and asking them. And essentially, some kids are just like, I just know. They can't, they don't have the language to tell you how they know. Or the sequencing of that language. Of yeah, work. I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. So the working memory and the sequencing, like Shelley suggests, uh, mentioned here, are those areas could be difficult for them. And that impacts the brain is impacted by their brain development. So this could be an area that's challenging and also anxiety producing. All right, so with all the possible challenges our neurodiverse students and the other students in our classes have and may be experiencing, how do we really approach meeting these needs? Okay. So we're gonna ask Shelly Moore some advice. She's got some advice for us. Hi, my name is Shelley Moore, and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. As Canadians, we have a reputation for finding and embracing the strength in our diversity. This value, however, hasn't been reflected in our classrooms, which still segregates students by ability, especially students with developmental disabilities. There's a gap in our understanding about what we know inclusive education to be philosophically versus what we understand and the importance of understanding inclusion in our practice. This is the question I'm trying to answer in my research, is how can we find the value in the day-to-day -day practice in our classrooms in terms of inclusive education? So how am I going to explain this to you? Now I can sit here and try and describe this, or we can have a little bit more fun. Why don't we go bowling? So let's talk about bowling. You have 10 pins, you have two balls, and you have a lane. The goal is to knock down as many pins as you can. But if you don't get them all, it's okay because you have another chance. But when I bowl and roll the ball down the middle and I don't knock them all down, what often ends up happening to me is that there's two pins left standing on either end and they stare at you. 
It's the seven times split and it's the hardest shot in bowling. How is bowling like teaching? The ball is the lesson, the pins are the kids. We aim for the middle, we do the best we can. The pins are left standing. We often have another chance to kind of get to them. But at the end of the day, those two pins that are staring, looking at you are our kids who need the most support and our kids who need the most challenge. So we end up choosing one and the other one is left standing. I just took all the fun out of bowling. Now, I don't know how many times you've watched professional bowling, but I spent an afternoon watching professional bowling. And let me tell you, there was not one bowler who rolled that ball down the middle of the lane. They threw the ball down the lane at a curve. And I was actually really curious about this. So I called up a professional bowler. He was so excited. I don't think he gets a lot of calls about education. He said, the reason why the ball has to enter at a curve is because you will knock down more pins and create a bigger domino effect if you enter at that angle. But in order to do that, you have to change your aim. In order to knock down the most pins with one shot, he aims for the pins that are the hardest to hit. Now let's just let this sink in for a second. We are taught to teach the head pin. We are not taught to teach the kids who are the furthest and the hardest to get to. The kids with autism, the kids with Down syndrome. The part that's critical here, and it really aligns with universal design for learning, is that so often the supports that we design for those kids on the outside of the lane are actually supports that all of the kids need. This is the part we need to understand if inclusive education is going to move forward in Canada. How can we find this value of diversity in our classrooms between the students? This is not just important for the outside pin, but it's critical for every single one of us. And just think, all we need to do is change our aim. Look how bowling changed education. So as Shelley Moore said in the video, uh, we need to aim at the pins that are the hardest. Hi, my name is if you're if you're providing accommodations for those neurodiverse neurodiverse students, those with FASD, ASD, autism, uh, ADHD, you also meet the needs of all those other students in between. And we often, I often go to a school and I hear this and I go, oh, that's a seven ten split. They need to do a seven ten split because they're finding it hard to navigate between supporting this student and giving everybody else what they need. So we can't overlook the fact that regardless of the grade or subject matter or activity, school is a social place. School is an ongoing, dynamically changing social experience. And these social experiences are so integral to the school experience that we fail to recognize the social demands. And it's necessary to look at challenges with social skills through a neurodiverse lens and reframe interactions to determine appropriate expectation, teaching approaches, and intervention strategies. And then as you get into the upper grades, social interactions are even more challenging and complex. And <clears throat> neurodiverse students can have uh, dismaturity, which means that they are developmentally younger than their chronological age in some areas. And the misinterpretation of social cues and the hidden curriculum of different situations um, can be difficult or challenging um, for those neurodiverse students. And a lot of them struggle with perspective taking and they may act impulsively and they may say things that they don't realize at times um, are affecting people and what the effect it might have on people. And also, um, it may seem like they don't care that they have that effect on the person, but, but um, these are definitely struggles for them. So we want you to consider the downstream effects of having challenges or stretches um, in all or some of these areas for students who are neurodiverse. Neurodiverse children and adults get an incredible amount of correction and negative feedback from their families, community, and professionals, which leads to any of these um, that you see above and most likely more. It is critical that we embrace all the diversities of the neurodivergent brain and limit labels so they can thrive, ignite their creativity, their innovation, and reach their potential. They can actually teach us many things.
So we have spoken to some of the differences experienced by our students who are neurodiverse, but in summary here, we want to highlight seven key takeaways. Oh, it's you again. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I didn't see my guess there. Um, giving children just right challenges. This can be hard for us in education because we know as educators, and I'm not just using my elastic band to help me keep focused, um, it's because in education, it's really hard to guess what is a just right challenge, right? And we kind of maybe start one place and then we go, oh, no, that was too easy. Because when, when we're learning anything new and different, I'm using my elastic band here, it is a stretch, right? We have to provide some stretch, um, stress on this band or to that person. But so it can be difficult to know what is just right. But we need to watch for those signs of cognitive stress. So like when a math question or a reading text is too difficult, um, we have to watch the child and look and what we might call body reading to see if the child um, is actually, this is too much for them. Because what happens is if we push too hard and say, oh, you can get it, or just, you know, try a little harder, um, what you're doing is actually having that memory of that situation stored in their stress response system has a negative memory. So that's why people like me, when I get a mad word problem that is worded such that I go, oh, no, can't do this, right? Because it's that was stored. I, found that most challenging probably in school, and then it was stored as a negative memory and a stress response is happening. So we, and then I go into, well, I go into freeze. I just go, oh, nah, I don't really need to do that math problem. Um, so this can be really difficult for us um, at times. And also we want you to meet students where they are, not where we think they should be. We speak often um, when Bridget and I go out about um, those developmental differences that students with uh, who are neurodivergent have. And it can be confusing to us because they can have some areas where they're really strong in, but also areas where they're quite challenged in and, and it's a real stretch for them. So we're all different in different ways and all of us are developing at various rates and we will mature they will mature at a different pace, but they will do it. And I think we also um, acknowledge that that's why some of our strategies don't work with students, because we're trying, we're addressing a skill level that they're just not developmentally at yet. I think uh, oftentimes uh, when we're out in schools, we're saying, meet the kids, meet them where they're at, meet them where they're at, meet them where they're at. They're not there yet. They can't line up on their own. They can't do this work on their own. So just meet them where they're at, adjust your expectations. Every student learns and some need more help than others to get there. Exactly what we just said, meet them where they're at. However, equaling the accessibility of learning rather than equaling how each person is taught and the way each person is accommodated. So think about what each child needs individually, not so accessing the curriculum and learning is, is a basic human right, and it's in there if you look it up. And making accommodations is not optional. We need to think of and present to students the belief that accommodations are normal. Well, I just think of now how we expect almost in every building to have a button to push so the door opens. And if there's not a button, we're almost a little confused. Right. And, it, you know, it's like, telling a deaf child that they cannot use sign language to communicate. Mm -hmm. So we need to think of these things as everyone needs accommodations. So again, just meet kids where they're at in that moment. Today, it may look like this, tomorrow it may look like that. that. When it comes to our students, there may be factors beyond our control, but what teachers do have control over are the decisions about how to present the curriculum so that the student is um, going to learn. And we want students to learn what works for them and what they need as supports and to be their own advocate. We want to teach them to be strategic learners, whether it is in the area of regulation or how to stay focused in a, in a class that's 30 minutes or 60 minutes, or in the area of learning styles. How do they best learn? How do they best show their understanding of what they've learned? 
We want to also demystify how people learn. We can teach about and model how the brain learns. And so is the child's educational experience going to be focused on deficits, remediation, and disorders where the student has the problems? Or is it going to be a strength-based model where they're where we are challenging the notion that normal is good and right, a model that doesn't minimize the challenges because they are real, but we do look for ways to support. And we want people to presume competence. We have to have the mindset that everyone can learn given the supports they need. Like everyone can learn if they can, yeah. right? So, Take the time to learn how the brain learns and regulates. When we understand the brain, we are better equipped to assist our students to be engaged, create a richer learning environment, give valuable feedback, and the ability to address their emotional and social needs, as well as their minds. There's so much information coming out about brain-based approach and learning, like Shelley and I have been diving into many books, can't keep up. And things seem to be changing, like ever-changing in this area. But when we know better, we can do better. We can give better advice, we can give better strategies, we can try new and better things. So our wish for you is to have a growth mindset. Likely you're using many of these strategies, tools and adaptations, which you've noticed that may work for a majority of your, of your learners in your class. As adults and co-regulators in a child's life, we need to consider our role. So we need to think about our thinking is it are we thinking negatively like oh that kid's just so lazy or do they understand the instructions or the language we're using with them like pay attention or um, telling them hey this information is important um, we can expect kids to have a growth we can't expect our kids to have a growth mindset unless we are doing it ourselves so think about what you're thinking and sometimes we definitely make mistakes and I know I'm like I look at people and say well we're going to trial and error we're going to try this we're going to give it a good long try and you know we'll cross our fingers it works and try try and try and try again so we don't have time to watch this video but we do it there's five minutes oh okay. yeah good yeah we okay. have five minutes I have a lot of memories from when I was a child one that's always stuck out to me though was when I was about 10 years old and I was in school and I struggled. And I, I didn't struggle with English, math, or science. I struggled holding still. And I would try to listen and focus and process ideas, but I couldn't help myself. And to be honest, I would sit there and then I would just start tapping. And the students in the class would look at me and they'd say, hey, stop tapping. A lot of the time, I didn't even realize I was doing it. And then eventually even the teachers got after me and they would yell at me and they'd say, Clint, you have to stop tapping. It got so bad that I got sent to the principal's office for tapping. And he said to me, okay, maybe when you go back to class, just try sitting on your hands. So I did. I went back to class and when I felt myself starting to tap, I just, I did this. I sat on my hands and that worked for about five seconds. One time I was tapping in class and my teacher, Mr. Jensen, he looked at me and he yelled. And he said, Clint, stay after class. And I thought to myself, this is all I am. Now I've always been the type of person that believes that a single moment in time can change a person's life. And this was one of those moments for me that I will never forget it. And so I was sitting there with Mr. Jensen and an empty classroom. He walked past me and he sat next to his desk and he said, Clint, come here, I want to talk to you. And as he looked me right in the eye, he said, no, I need you to know something, you're not in trouble. But I do have just one question that I have to ask you. And he asked, he said, have you ever thought about playing the drums? And in that moment, Mr. Jensen, he leaned back and he opened the top drawer of his desk. And he reached in and he pulled out my very first pair of drumsticks. And he held them in his hands and he looked at me and he said, hey, Clint, you're not a problem. I think you're a drum team.
that moment on, I've never put those six down. I've toured, recorded, played drums all over the world. My whole college education paid for with drum sticks in my hand. Just because of a single moment in time when somebody believed in me, he saw something in me that I didn't even see within myself. And from that moment, I looked. Time. It's a great visual. I have a lot of memories. Really reminds me of one of my mentors, um, Dr. Stuart Shanker, where he says, When you see a child differently, you see a different child. I can't get through that video without just having some emotional reactions. But in essence, here, uh, the neurodiversity movement is encouraging people to view the neurological differences as normal variations of the human brain. And it encourages us to reject culturally entrenched negativity, which is typically surrounded by those that live, learn, and view the world differently. And I feel like I need to say, be a Mr. Jensen. <laughs> Thank you. And just so you know that there are a lot of resources yeah. on the handout. You'll get uh, a lot of resources in the handout that you'll receive with uh, the evaluation. I think you can stop sharing the screen. Thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic. I would just, I'm going to invite, if I, I haven't seen any questions pop up in the chat, but I'll just invite if anybody has any questions, so you're welcome to um, ask. And before we get into that, in case anyone has to go right away, thanks everyone for coming. And um, as mentioned, we will be sending out uh, an email with some resources and also with an evaluation form. So please do send us your feedback. We use that to uh, decide what we're going to present on next. And uh, the video for this session will be available on the Manitoba FASD Coalition website next week. And it will be posted for a week after it's up. So um, you'll be able to view it there. And our next info series is on uh, Friday, January 27th.